All right, guys, so we are doing yet another lecture of um, distance learning. Uh, today we are going to be talking about Henry VIII and his six wives, uh, more specifically Henry VIII and basically his conflict with the Church of England. Uh, so, of course, Henry VIII uh, reigned during the House of Tudor, and the House of Tudor will last between the years of 1485 to 1603 with the death death of Elizabeth I or Elizabeth I of England. And it will be started with Henry VII, who would be um, Henry VIII's father. Uh, and in order to, and there's only going to be five monarchs with the House of Tudor, uh, starting with Henry VIII's father, Henry VII, followed by Henry VIII himself, followed by his uh, short-lived uh, reign of his son Edward VI, uh, followed by Mary I, also known as Bloody Mary, but we'll get into more detail of that later, and then finally finishing off with Elizabeth's reign, um, and of course, again, it would end with her death in 1603. Um, and of course, the House of Tudor is a very turbulent time uh, for England. Uh, essentially, um, you know, there's lots of adultery, incest, treason, um, a lot of, lots and lots of uh, beheadings and executions. Um, and of course, my favorite, uh, a misunderstanding of biological processes on Henry VIII's part because he kept trying to produce um, sons and he would get uh, angry when a son wasn't produced, but of course it's his fault because he's the one that uh, contributes to the um, contribute to the Y chromosome. Just a little biological tidbit there for you. Uh, but without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Right, so Henry VIII and his six wives. So of course this is Henry VIII himself. Um, his first wife will be Catherine of Aragon. Uh, Catherine of Aragon had been married to Henry's older brother Arthur. Uh, this made for a political alliance. However, he died, which resulted in Henry eventually becoming king, and she was still young, so married Henry. Uh, their daughter Mary was the only child to survive until the adulthood. And of course, that's Bloody Mary. And Catherine was pregnant six times altogether. So the first pregnancy, happening in August in 1509, two months after the wedding to Henry VIII, Catherine's first pregnancy was announced on January 31st, 1510. And she ended up delivering a stillborn girl, basically a girl that was born dead. Uh, her second pregnancy... Uh, in May 1510, um, four months after the loss of her first child, Catherine announced her second pregnancy. A son, Henry the Duke of Cornwall, was born on the 1st of January, 1511. Uh, in his honor, guns were fired from the Tower of London, and the city bells were rung uh, because uh, beacons were lit, and free wine was distributed to all the population. Five days after his birth, on the 6th of January, 1511, the prince was christened, at Richmond Palace, and christening, a christening is basically uh, where they're given their, uh, where the baby is given a Christian name at, at baptism as a sign of admission to the Christian Church. Um, and the prince again was christened at Richmond Palace, his godparents being the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Earl of Surrey, and the Countess of Devon. On the twenty second, uh, February fifteen eleven, after only fifty two days of life. The young prince died suddenly. It was said that he died of intestinal complaint. Um, the third of six pregnancies, by early 1513, Catherine was pregnant again on June 30th, uh, of the 30th of June uh, 1513. Catherine was left as regent in England when Henry VIII went to fight in France. On the 17th of September 1513, she went into labor prematurely and gave birth to a boy who was either stillborn or died shortly after birth, um, they're not exactly sure. And again, stillborn is when the baby is born dead. The fourth of the six pregnancies, in June 1514, Catherine announced her fourth pregnancy. Um, in December 1514, she gave birth to a short-lived boy. In the summer of 1515, Catherine 
announced her fifth pregnancy. However, less hope was placed on an heir following her previous failed pregnancies. On the 18th of February, 1516, Catherine delivered a healthy girl at 4 a.m. at Greenwich Palace, uh, which is known today as the Palace of Placentia in Kent. She was named Mary, and this is, of course, the famous Mary I of England, and christened three days later uh, on the 21st of February with a great ceremony at the Church of Observant Friars. And uh, these friars are basically a group of people uh, that are primarily certain religious orders that have adopted a life of poverty, traveling and living in urban areas for the purposes of preaching, evangelization, and ministry, especially to the poor. Uh, despite his disappointment, uh, Henry VIII said that if it were a girl this time, then surely boys uh, would follow. The sixth and final pregnancy in February uh, 1518, uh, Catherine announced her sixth and final pregnancy. In March, she visited Merton College, which is located in modern-day England today. Um, in Oxford, and also made a pilgrimage, which is basically a journey for religious reasons, to the shrine of St. Frilzeswide. And um, the shrine was named after this uh, English princess and, and um, sorry, and Abers, which is a female superior, sorry, um, Abbas, which is a, basically a female superior and community of nuns known for establishing religious uh, known for establishing a religious site, letter incorporated into Christ Church in Oxford. She was the first abbess of this Oxford double uh, monastery. So basically she was just a mother superior to a lot of nuns, and she was also known as an English uh, princess. Um, and when, and basically uh, Catherine visited, sorry, not Catherine, um, Mary vis. my apologies, um, Catherine visited this shrine, um, basically asking for a healthy son. And on the 10th of November, 1518, uh, she gave birth to a daughter at eight months gestation, but the child was weak and lived for only a few hours. And Mary, and Mary of Church, which, we, which will be important later on, but I'll just go ahead and uh, say a little detail now. Uh, Mary had over 280 religious dissenters burned at the stake in what were known as the Marian persecutions, uh, which led to her denunciation as Bloody Mary by her Protestant opponents. Uh, Protestants were executed in England under heresy laws during the reigns of Henry VIII. Uh, again, um, Henry VIII reigned from 1509 to 1547 in his death, and Mary I, of course, reigned from 1553 to 1558 uh, with her death. So again, uh, basically the most famous... Um, child of Catherine of Aragon would be Mary the First or Bloody Mary. All right. So basically, in a nutshell, Catherine had multiple miscarriages, and several children would die soon after birth. Henry was nervous about his lineage since his father, Henry the Seventh, was was the first Tudor monarch of England between the years of 1485 to 1603, uh, after the long war of the roses over the English throne. Ooh, sorry. So basically, Henry VIII, um, let me just go back for a second here. Okay. So Henry VIII, uh, again, was Tudor King of England, and he was without a male heir, of course, until Edward. And he would keep uh, produce, uh, he would keep trying to produce uh, prominent male heirs because he believed that males were stronger rulers uh, than females. So he wants to divorce Mary. So he wants to divorce and marry a younger woman known as Anne Boleyn. Um, and of course, you know he caught. She caught his attention almost immediately. Um, Henry desperately wanted a male heir to the throne to cement the Tudor family as the rightful rulers of England. The Wars of the Roses were not too far in the past, and he was afraid a daughter might not be able to keep the throne. Uh, Catherine of Aragon was 42 years old, past the age of being able 
to give birth and had already miscarried many times. All right. All right, so the Pope, so does not allow for divorce or an annulment, has close ties with Spain and refuses to grant an annulment or divorce for, for Henry. So the Pope, um, known as Pope Clement VII, had close ties to Spain, meant he was unlikely to grant a divorce to Henry from his Spanish wife, Catherine. Roman Catholic teaching also states that marriage is indivisible until death, and thus the Pope cannot annul or declare a marriage to have had no legal existence, a marriage even if he wanted to. When he refused to annul Henry's marriage or grant a divorce, he was furious. As King of England, Henry felt he could do as he pleased, and a Pope could not refuse him. And a little more detail on, on the Pope himself. Uh, Pope Clement VII was born uh, Giulio de Giuliano de' Medici in modern-day Florence, Italy today, and was head of the Catholic Church. And of course, the Catholic Church being the Roman Catholic Church, which is the largest Christian church today, and ruler of the Papal States, uh, which I'll go over in a little more detail in a bit, um, from the 19th of November, 1523, to his death, on the 25th of September, 1534. The most unfortunate of the popes, Clement VII's reign was marked by a rapid succession of political, military, and religious struggles, many uh, long in the making, which had far-reaching consequences for Christianity and world politics. The papal, the papal states, uh, officially the state of the church, were a series of territories in the Italian peninsula under the direct sovereign rule of the pope, from the 8th century until 1870. So we have a question to ask, what is King Henry's major problem and what do you believe he should or could do about it? So obviously his problem was he wanted a divorce from Catherine of Aragon but could not do so with the current, um, with his current ties to the Catholic faith and, and Roman Catholicism. So he decides to put matters into his own hands. He passes the Act of Supremacy, which basically dismissed the power of the Pope. Parliament annuls his marriage, and he marries Anne Boleyn. Uh, so Henry was enamored with Anne Boleyn. He was infatuated with her. He thought she was very beautiful. Um, who was in the service of his wife, uh, he already had he and he had also already had an affair with Anne's sister Mary. So just to add more to the drama, because what is history without a little bit of drama? Um, he had already before he even married Anne Boleyn. While he was married to Catherine of Aragon, he had an affair with Anne's sister Mary, and Anne was the younger uh, of the two. Uh, and when I say married, uh, I'm not. You know, not to not be confused with Mary the First of England. Okay. So Anne, however, was ambitious, smart, and hot-tempered. She refused to be with the king unless he married her. After Henry broke away from the church and named himself head of the supreme head of the Church of England, a title created in 1551, sorry, 1531, when he established the Church of England as separate from the authority of the Holy See, um, jurisdiction of the bishop of Rome or Pope and allegiance to the Pope, and jurisdiction is basically official power to make legal decisions and actions, and had his marriage annulled. They wed in 1533. Parliament passed the official Act of Supremacy in 1534 and declared Henry, once again, as I stated before, the supreme head of the Church of England. All right, so Henry and Anne's first daughter was born soon after their marriage and was named Elizabeth, who would become the future Queen of England, uh, who would basically um, live between the years of 1533 to 1603 and ruled from the 17th of November 1558 to her death on the 24th of March in 1603. Um, sometimes called the Virgin Queen because of her refusal to marry, was the last of the fine monarchs, as stated before, of the House of Tudor. And it's believed that the cosmetic concoction, or a mixture of various ingredients or elements, Elizabeth used to cultivate 
her parent used her infamous pale look may have impacted her health and contributed to her death. Elizabeth I was a long ruling queen of England, governing with relative stability and prosperity for 44 years. The Elizabeth era is named uh, the Elizabethan era is named uh, for her for her reign. So, but Anne's later pre pregnancies resulted in stillborn or born dead births. Henry went back to having affairs, which made Anne furious after these, which made Anne furious. Sorry, after the stillbirths and the falling apart of their marriage, Henry began to second guess his marriage to Anne and would start to look elsewhere for a new bride. Okay, so you can see his frustration there. And, of course, the little one there is Queen Elizabeth herself. And, of course, her mother there, Anne Boleyn. So, again, Anne Boleyn. Anne could not give Henry a son so very quickly. She fell out of favor also, but did not want a divorce or annulment. So, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, so, Anne had uh, made enemies in the king's court for her outspokenness and fits of anger. It is believed that Thomas Cromwell, um, the English lawyer and statement, statesman, chief minister to the king, and Anne's former friend, chief minister was... The chief minister is defined as an informal position of the time given to various people who presided over the government of England and subsequently Great Britain at the pledge of the monarch, usually uh, with the monarch's permission. Prior to the government, under Robert Walpole, as Prime Minister in 1721. And of course, the position of the Prime Minister, um, which still exists today, is the head of government of the United Kingdom. The Prime Minister directs um, both the executive and the legislature, and together with the cabinet, is accountable to the monarch, to Parliament, which is, again, Parliament is basically your legislative body, uh, to their party, and ultimately to the electorate or the people for the government's policies and actions. Uh, Essentially, they plotted her downfall, okay? Uh, she was charged with adultery, incest, and witchcraft in 1536 and put on trial. And, of course, adultery is when you're cheating on your spouse. Incest is, you know, um, sort of private relations with your siblings, which is not appropriate. Um, and witchcraft, of course, is pretty self-explanatory. So, again, in 1536, she was put on trial uh, she denied all the charges against her, but was found guilty. Um, after having incited controversy for divorcing his first wife, Henry VIII, had Bolin executed, basically beheaded, on May 19th, 1536. So, goodbye, Anne Boleyn. All right, so next we have Jane Seymour. Okay, who would give birth to, as you can see there, Edward VI. So Jane Seymour was a lady-in-waiting, basically a woman who attends to a, uh, a queen or princess for Anne Boleyn, uh, Henry VIII's second wife. She was not very educated, but Henry was very attracted to her. Besides her looks, Seymour's timid um, showing... Uh, sorry, timid is basically showing a lack of courage or confidence or easily frightened and reserved nature attracted the king, um, a stark contrast or a severe contrast to his previous two wives. So, of course, um, this is his third wife. She married Henry 11 days later after Anne was executed. Unlike her predecessors, she never underwent a coronation, thus was never officially crowned queen. She gave birth to baby Edward VI, as you can see there, on October 12, 1537, the heir that Henry had so desperately wanted. The details of Edward VI, um, I just want to say, short reign are posted on the OSS Connect course page, uh, for which you can read later for extra information, just so you know. Because uh, you will be tested on that. Oh, sorry, you will not be tested on that. My apologies. All right. So, here we have a family portrait, uh, which is just an imagination. Unfortunately, because Jane died from childbirth complications nine days later after Edward's birth, so um, they're not certain um, that's how she looked at the time she was alive. Um, as mother of his beloved heir, Henry VIII, um, Henry VIII uh, to the death of his third wife, 
He took it hard, uh, basically. Um, not only did he reportedly wear black for months after her death, but he also um, waited three more years to eventually remarry uh, and get his fourth wife. All right, so of course he's single and looking for another wife. So now single after the death of his wife, Jane, but with his male heir, Henry is free to marry again. What might he be looking for this time? Um, basically, um, he would remarry again uh, for political reasons. All right, so Anne was a German princess and married Henry for political reasons and to strengthen uh, Protestantism. Henry liked her portrait, but when he finally met her, he was very disappointed. Their marriage was doomed from the start. Luckily, she was as happy to leave him as he was to leave her. All right, so Anne of Cleves was a German princess, uh, then was known as the Holy Roman Empire, the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, and again, to be distinguished from the Western Roman Empire after the split of the Roman Empire along with the Byzantine Empire in the East, okay? So when we're talking about this Holy Roman Empire, we're not talking about the Western Roman Empire that occurred at the time of the Byzantine Empire, uh, as we stated in a previous lecture when we talked about the Byzantine Empire before the uh, Christmas break. Um, and was from a family that supported the Protestant Reformation. A connection between she and the King of England would be important politically, Henry sent the artist Hans Holbein the Younger to paint portraits of Anne and her younger sister. So as you can see here. Uh, Amalia, each of um, whom Henry was considering as his fourth wife. So he was considering both Anne of Cleves and Amalia as his fourth wife. Uh, Henry acquired the artist to be as accurate as possible, not to flatter the sisters, basically to be sincere in this context. However, uh, when she came to England, Henry was supposedly very disappointed uh, with her looks when he met her in person and referred to as a Flanders mare, <laughs> um, as in a horse because her nose was rather large. Uh, and basically, for those of you who don't know, a Flanders mare was a big horse known for its size and strength and used in medieval wars. Uh, so yeah, he wasn't very <laughs> kind to her physical looks. Uh, it didn't help that she could barely speak English and was not very excited about Henry either. She and Henry agreed to annul the marriage after only six months, and she was given a generous settlement as a result. So moving right along, so we have Catherine Howard. So Catherine was only 19 and in the royal court when she caught the 49-year-old Henry's eye. Her family also had political connections. Uh, they married in 1540. However, she was found to be having an affair of her own the next year, so it was um, not too good for her. Um, Catherine's uncle, the Duke of Norfolk, uh, found her a place in the royal court. Henry called her also a perfect jewel of womanhood and a rose without a thorn. Um, according to some historians, uh, these were not Henry's words, but rather the words of his privy council. Uh, and a privy council is basically a body that advises the head of state, in this case Henry, um, of a nation, typically but not always in the context of a monarchic uh, government. The word privy uh, means private or secret, thus a privy council was originally um, a committee of the monarch's closest advisors to give confidential advice on state affairs. Evolving out of the Privy Council, in Great Britain today it is known as the Cabinet, cabinet similar but distinct from the U.S. to um, from the from the uh, the U.S. Cabinet to our President. So Henry the Eighth may well have believed Catherine to be unblemished and perfect, but the romantic motto and badge seems to be uh, fiction. So it's a shame that. Supposedly, he described her as something that was beautiful, but there's no evidence of that. Catherine Howard was married to Henry for less than two years. Uh, it was claimed or alleged that early in 1541, Catherine began an affair with Henry's favorite male courtier. Uh, and a courtier is basically a person who attends 
Royal Court as a companion or advisor to the king or queen, Thomas Culpepper, um, a young man who Catherine considered uh, marrying during her time as a maid of honor, uh, which is, you know, and of course a maid of honor is the head of taking care of the bride up until and during the wedding day, uh, to Anne of Cleves. So she was a maid of honor to one of uh, Henry VIII's uh, previous wives. Uh, some people known knew of the affair, began to ask her favors of her um, in return of, for their silence. Eventually, Henry found out about her adultery, and she was tried for treason, which is basically the crime of betraying one's country. Uh, Culpepper was to be was to be executed, okay, um, by being hanged, drawn, and quartered. And for those of you that get a little queasy, all right, I do advise you just to kind of bear with me for a moment. Um, so it was a, to be hanged, uh, drawn, and quartered was from 1352, basically a statutory um, penalty in England for men convicted of high treason. Um, and basically statutory means a formal written enactment of a legislative authority that governs the legal entities of a city, state, or country uh, by way of consent or a person voluntarily agreeing to the proposal or desires of another. Okay, so it's a voluntary agreement here. Um, and basically high treason is criminal disloyalty typically to the state. Although the ritual was first recorded in the reign of King Henry III, who existed between the years of 1216 and 1272, the convicted traitor was fastened to a hurdle or wooden panel, typically a ladder, uh, and drawn by horse to the place of execution, where he would have been hanged almost to the point of death, emasculated, which is basically removal of male private parts, disemboweled, uh, removal of some or all of the organs of the gastrointestinal tract, usually through a horizontal incision made across the abdominal area, beheaded, uh, completed, complete separation of head from the body, and then finally, if that wasn't enough, quartered, basically the act of cutting, tearing, pulling, wrenching, wrenching or otherwise removing limbs of a living thing, especially, essentially uh, chopped into four pieces. His remains would have been displayed in prominent, uh, basically important or famous places across the country, such as uh, the London Bridge, to serve as a warning of the fate of traitors. Uh, for reasons of public decency, women convicted of high treason were instead burned at the stake. Although the act of parliament, uh, parliament defining high treason remains on the United Kingdom's statute books uh, during a long period of 19th century legal reform, the sentence of hanging, drawing, and quartering was changed to drawing, hanging until dead, and posthumous um, occurring basically um, awarded or appearing after the death of the originator, essentially the deceased, beheading and quartering uh, before being abolished in England in 1870. So there, was, there were slight changes there. So instead of being hung until the point of death and then beheaded, they were usually uh, beheaded after death. Um, so that, that was like the biggest um, change there. And of course, the death penalty for high treason was abolished in 1998. Culpepper, presumably because of his former closeness to the king, received a commuted or reduce, uh, commuted basically, which is a reduction in, the, in a judicial sentence, especially a sentence of death, to one less mm. severe. A uh, sentence of, uh, basically, um, he wasn't hanged, drawled, and quartered. Uh, he was basically uh, just beheaded um, instead of all of that. And Catherine was um, basically beheaded after in 1542. And a little more detail on Catherine. Um, the night before her execution, Catherine is believed to have spent many hours practicing how to lay her hand upon the block. So she was basically practicing uh, to be executed, uh, which but had been brought to her at her request. She died with relative composure. Um, so she kind of kept herself together for the most part, but looked pale and terrified. Uh, she required assistance to climb the scaffold. She made a speech describing her punishment as worthy and just, 
and asked for mercy for her family and prayers for her soul. Um, according to popular folklore, and folklore, of course, is the traditional beliefs, customs, and stories of a, of a community passed through the generations by word of mouth instead of being written down. Supposedly, she said, her last words were, I die a queen, but I would rather have died the wife of Culpepper. However, no eyewitness uh, accounts uh, support this. Uh, instead, reporting that she stuck to traditional final words, asking for forgiveness for her sins, and acknowledging that she deserved to die a thousand deaths for betraying the king, who had always treated her so graciously. Uh, this was typical, uh, by the way, of the speeches given by those executed during that period, most likely in an effort uh, to protect their families. Um, since the condemned last words would be relayed to the king, uh, Catherine was beheaded with a single stro stroke of the executioner's axe. All right, so Henry VIII's sixth and final wife um, was Catherine Parr. Henry's last last wife was more of a companion and a nurse who took care of him in his old age. Uh, she took care of his family and helped Henry to pass an act that confirmed both Mary's and Elizabeth's line in succession for the throne after Edward. Um, so basically Henry VIII married his last wife um, because he was very ill, um, and he needed a wife to basically nurse him and kind of look after him because he was dying. Um, he was also, sorry, he also wanted uh, someone to protect his, um, basically his uh, Protestant legacy, should he and his son Edward the Sixth die, which he would die later at the age of 15 in 1553. Uh, Henry uh, would be um, her, her third husband. Uh, she outlived Henry and would marry for the fourth time. Uh, so basically, on his deathbed, Edward and his advisors... Oh, sorry. So basically, um, Edward VI had a very short reign, and that's the, the middle picture there. That's, that's Edward VI. Um, on his deathbed, Edward and his advisors named his first cousin once removed, 16-year-old uh, Lady Jane Grey, to be the next queen. However, uh, Mary assembled a force and successfully deposed which is basically to remove from office suddenly and forcefully, Jane, who was beheaded. Uh, in 1554, Mary I of England, also known as Bloody Mary once again, uh, married Philip II of Spain and attempted to restore England to the Roman Catholicism. After the short-lived um, Protestant reign of her half-brother, she died after only five years, however, but during her reign, she had over 280 religious dissenters burned at the stake. So again, Edward was crowned at age nine, but dies at age 15. Mary takes over brief, uh, and briefly returns England to Catholicism. Queen Elizabeth rules for 44 years and established the Anglican Church, and Protestantism grows, and, and the Catholic Church starts to lose power. So again, Queen Elizabeth being Queen Elizabeth I. Um, so again, Edward VI would reign after Henry VIII's death, but his reign would be short-lived, okay? Um, um, her re so back to uh, Mary I, her reestablishment of Roman Catholicism was reversed. After the death in 1558 by her younger half-sister and successor Elizabeth I, daughter of Henry and Anne Boleyn, who was again uh, Henry VIII's second wife. Uh, Elizabeth would dominate the next 40 years, Okay, or 44 years or so, and bring about a golden age in England. Uh, England's victory against the Spanish Armada, which was the Habsburg Spanish fleet of over 130 ships, in 1588 associated with Elizabeth. Um, basically, here, victory, or England's victory over the Spanish Armada in 1588 associated, associated sorry, Elizabeth with one of the uh, greatest military victories in English history. All right, and of course on the far left there, that's Queen Mary the first. All right, and then of course the little, the picture of the little girl holding the doll, that's uh, Elizabeth. All right, so again, um, sorry, so again, um, 
on the far right there, that, that's the picture of Queen Elizabeth I. Okay, in the middle there, that's um, Edward VI. And on the far left there, that's uh, Queen Mary I. All right, guys, so again, um, if you have any questions, feel free to use the Microsoft Teams chat room. Um, it looks like Mr. Kalesh has added, or Kalesh, sorry, has added um, certain channels within the Microsoft Teams. And again, those links are posted um, on OSS Connect, or that link is posted on OSS Connect. Um, of course, you can always email me as well. And I hope you've enjoyed uh, today's presentation. See you guys later. Bye.